Welcome, and Ramadan Mubarak on this snowy evening in Denver, Colorado. My name is Tamara Pearson Destray, and I teach here in the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, as well as direct the Conflict Resolution Institute here at the University of Denver. I'd like to share a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the three co-sponsoring units collaborating to bring you this event this evening. I'd like to provide a particular welcome to those from Professor Woodall's class and from the community that may be joining us this evening. In addition to the Conflict Resolution Institute, this event is being brought to you by the Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies Center for Middle East Studies, also in the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies here at the University of Denver, and also the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs Global Intercultural Research Center. I appreciate the opportunity this event has given us to work together. I'd also like to thank in particular Anna Metropolis of the Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies who's running logistics behind the scene for us today. So I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to my Middle East Center colleague, Professor, Professor Carol Woodall of the Department of History at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Carol. Hello. Um, also, I'd like to welcome individuals from the UCCS community who are joining us in this cross-institutional collaboration event. And also, in particular, the event was scheduled to coincide with um, a class that I'm teaching this spring entitled Voicing Descent in Modern Turkey. And so I can say on behalf of the students that they are most excited about this evening's event and have prepared. Yes, Tamara. Okay, um, so I am going to go ahead and share my screen to get us started here. So the context and focus of our discussion today is on the conflict over the area known as Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh, where most wars in the international system today are over participation and group rights within states. This is one of those few active conflicts in the world that is still over that age old tinder for wars, that of territory. Yet it is also about identity and sovereignty and so much more. It's often held up as an example of the category known as frozen conflicts, conflicts where there may be no war, but also no peace that endure for decades and sometimes for generations. However, as we've seen last year, this conflict has not stayed frozen. In the most recent round of violence, over 5,000 people died and tens of thousands were displaced. When a peace agreement brokered by Russia was finally signed on November 9th, the fighting for this round stopped. However, as with so many intractable conflicts around the world, we see a lack of full resolution of the issues, grievances, and needs so that we can predict that this conflict will continue to fester in the future. We here in the co-sponsoring institutions have felt that while this conflict raged in the Caucasus, little attention was paid to it in the Western media. When it was featured at all, the analysis was most often cursory and superficial, sometimes one-sided and did little to help us understand both how it came to this point and how things might go forward more constructively. We hope to have that conversation with our panelists today. Another thing that we thought was important today was the importance of hearing stories. Often conflicts come with silencing, silencing of dissent, and of personal experiences. And we hope to encourage the recognizing of those stories today. Finally, we've chosen to bring you an array of varied perspectives on this region, this location, and this conflict. Human relations are complicated and it serves no one if we examine things with only one lens. Therefore, we've sought to hear from both Armenian and Azerbaijani speakers and from those who could teach us about what different disciplinary and professional lenses might allow us to learn about this multi-layered conflict. 
we're privileged to have this diverse panel with us today. After the introductions, we will begin with brief remarks from our speakers, and then we will give our speakers the opportunity to comment or ask questions on each other's presentations. Then we will have an opportunity for all of us to pose questions to particular panel members or to the panel as a whole. So I would encourage you to submit any questions that you might have to the question function in Zoom, where they will be collated and brought forward to our speakers for the discussion. So I will now turn it over to my uh, Center for Middle Eastern Studies colleague, Professor of History, Carol Woodall, to introduce our speakers. Carol. Thank you, Tamara, very much. So the order of our speakers will go as such. Um, Dr. Stefan Asturian will begin. He is director of the Armenian Studies Program and associate adjunct professor in the Department of History at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author of the forthcoming work at the crossroads of the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, history, territory, nationalisms. Our second speaker, Ralph Mamadov, is a resident scholar on energy policy at the Middle East Institute. He focuses on issues of energy security, global energy industry trends, as well as energy relations between the Middle East, Central Asia, and South Caucasus. He has a particular emphasis on the post-Soviet countries of Eurasia. Prior to joining MEI, Mamadov held top administrative positions for the state oil company of the Azerbaijan Republic. Our third speaker, Dr. Artyom Tunoyan, is a research fellow at the University of Minnesota Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, where his research is focused on the intersection of religion and conflict in the South Caucasus. He is the editor of the forthcoming volume on the Soviet and Russian media's coverage of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, Black Garden of Flame, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict in the Soviet and Russian media. Our fourth speaker is unable to be with us this evening due to um, time differences. However, Arzu Gebula has provided us with a video which we will be screening for everyone. Arzu is an Azerbaijani journalist with a special focus on digital authoritarianism and its implications on human rights and press freedom in Azerbaijan. Arzu has written for Al Jazeera, Eurasia Net, Open Democracy, Radio Free Europe, and CNN International. In 2019, Arzu launched Azerbaijan Internet Watch, a platform that documents and monitors information controls in Azerbaijan. She is a former affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and a former Central Asia, Asia Azerbaijan Fellow at George Washington University. We are very pleased to welcome Josh Kuchera, who is the Caucasus editor at Eurasia Net, a publication focusing on the former Soviet Union and has extensively covered the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. Mr. Kuchera is actually going to provide a comment after the four speakers, specifically to what Arzu has stated. But then in addition, he's going to be able to answer specific questions as it pertains to the media landscape from his lens. Thank you all very much for joining us. Our first speaker, Dr. Stefan Asturian. Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this interesting event, and I am glad to see for the first time some of my colleagues. Uh, I am going to try uh, to deal with two uh, quick issues. Uh, first, uh, to touch upon uh, the, the impact of this conflict in a remote, uh, mostly unknown region of the world, its impact on international politics and regional politics, including the internal politics of Azerbaijan and Armenia. And uh, mostly, uh, I will try to cover the history of that region. Uh, there are divergent historiographies. Uh, so I, uh, I will try to set the background uh, of the whole thing. I don't know if I can do it in nine minutes, but we'll do it, we'll try. 
So few people, uh, few students of the Soviet Union uh, predicted in the 1970s or even in most of the 1980s that minor ethno-territorial problems would eventually be one of the key factors leading to the breakdown of that state. And none foresaw that the Soviet collapse would in turn give great salience to these local territorial problems. Since 1988, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, NKAO, a mountainous enclave of approximately 4,400 square kilometers, situated in the former Azerbaijan Soviet Socialist Republic, best illustrates the far-reaching consequences of such ethno-territorial disputes. Suffice it here to mention very concisely some of its international and national consequences. It underlined the persistence of the old Armenian-Turkish antagonism stemming from the Armenian genocide of 1915. In the 1990s, early 2000s, it got in the way of Turkey's new foreign policy, which aimed at filling the power vacuum from the Balkans to Central Asia, uh, left in communism's wake. Uh, and it hampered the hegemonic role of Turkey at that time uh, in Transcaucasia. The war strengthened Russian political and military leverage over Armenia, obviously mountainous Karabakh, and to a lesser extent, Azerbaijan. Uh, its process of international resolution through the Organization of, uh, for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, has essentially so far failed, even though it involves Russian, Americans and uh, French. Uh, but uh, more importantly, uh, this conflict has resulted in uh, pogroms, ethnic cleansing, massive refugee crises, and it has also shaped the political development of post-Soviet Armenia and Azerbaijan, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict having been used on both sides to essentially strengthen internal authoritarianism and self-glorification on the part of the respective leaders. Finally, the latest war which took place in the fall has changed significantly the geopolitical situation of the region with Turkey asserting its significant regional role there and Russia finalizing what has been called what was called the Lavrov plan presented at the end of 2015 by Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, that is bringing Russian troops to Karabakh as uh, super peacekeepers and even uh, having some of them in Russia, uh, in Azerbaijan. Also, uh, Russian peacekeepers now have a say in the south of Armenia, with Armenia having lost a significant part of its uh, sovereignty. So an obscure conflict, you see, has a large scale uh, 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 consequences. And the latest war has also revealed either the impotence or the unwillingness of the West, the US, and even more so uh, uh, the European Union uh, in uh, having a say in what has been going on in that region. Uh, the whole issue uh, started in 1988, but its origins go back uh, uh, to uh, uh, the Russian imperial period and obviously the Soviet uh, period. Uh, the bottom line, if we look at the beginning of the events, uh, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh so-called autonomous oblast um, decided, uh, you know, the Republic of Azerbaijan uh, decided to cancel the autonomous status of that province in its extraordinary session of November the 26th, 1991. And then the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenian population voted by 99% in favor of independence in a referendum organized on the 10th of December, 1991. A war ensued, uh, first low intensity warfare, 
which morphed into a full-scale uh, traditional classical war in 1993-94, uh, which resulted in the defeat of the Azerbaijani troops at that time for various reasons, uh, internal problems in Azerbaijan, political uh, competition among various groups. Uh, the Armenian officer corps, uh, they had a, a better prepared officer corps at that time. Uh, the, they had fought in uh, Afghanistan and so on. Uh, uh, bottom line, Azerbaijan lost all or part of seven of its uh, regions, uh, five fully and two actually uh, partly. Uh, there were no Azerbaijanis left in a mountainous Karabakh uh, and uh, various pogroms in Azerbaijan, starting with the Sumgait pogrom in, at the end of February 1988, followed by the Kirovabad ones in the fall, and then the major one in Baku, uh, led to the cleansing of the Armenian population in Soviet Azerbaijan. And by the fall of 1988, uh, uh, that is after Sungait and approximately at the time of Kirovabad, the Azerbaijanis living in Armenia also were driven out of Armenia. So we have a cons ethnic consolidation of both uh, Soviet, rep uh, re both republics at that time with the misery you can imagine uh, resulting from that process. Hmm? Uh, now, a historical background which will be contested by the quasi-official historiography uh, uh, promoted in Azerbaijan, in Soviet Azerbaijan from the early 60s onward, uh, the founder being a historian known as uh, Zia Bunyatov. Uh, the region of uh, mountainous Karabakh, actually it's part of Karabakh as a whole, it's the mountainous area. Uh, uh, the plains are very clearly predominantly uh, uh, Muslim and Azerbaijani inhabited historically. So the issue pertains to that mountainous uh, area. That area was part of one of the historic provinces of Armenia as described in a famous uh, book uh, manuscript of the uh, probably 5th century. Uh, it was made up of two regions, Artsakh and Utik. Uh, um, that area, we don't know who inhabited it in the antiquity, in antiquity uh, probably predominantly Armenians, but we don't have statistics, you can imagine. Uh, what is very clear is that up to the 4th century, it is end of the 4th century, it's part of Armenian kingdoms. Then the Persians, for various reasons, the Sassanid Persians uh, create a Caucasian Albanian kingdom there, uh, which will last uh, uh, up to the 6th century. One minute, okay, well, uh, that will be difficult. Uh, bottom line, after the ninth century, the region comes again under Armenian control. And uh, uh, subsequently, it has a kind of semi-autonomous status under Armenian princes, Meliks, who were at the forefront of the so-called Armenian liberation struggle, according to Soviet Armenian historiography. The, these are the words they use in the 17th, 18th century. Under Russian imperial rule, what is very important from 1805 onward, uh, uh, mountainous Karabakh was always put in areas, in districts that were predominantly Muslim. Hmm? For example, Elizabeth Paul Gubernia and so on. Okay, it was always detached uh, uh, from uh, the mainly or partly Armenian inhabited area. The period of the republics, uh, the Russian revolution was followed by a power vacuum, uh, uh, which led to the emergence of three republics, including the Armenian Azerbaijani one. And this is the key moment, even though there is another one preceding it in 1905, because vast areas of the Caucasus had mixed populations, 
And uh, this period of the Republic is actually a period of ethnic cleansing and ethnic consolidation in that area. Okay. Uh, uh, the mountainous part of Karabakh wanted to join Armenia. It was predominantly Armenian inhabited. Yeah, I will stop in a minute because, you know, it's a very <laughs> short. Uh, uh, bottom line in November, end November 1920, early December 1921, uh, even Azerbaijani Bolshevik authorities stated clearly that they agreed to the uh, to uh, Karabakh joining Armenia. Then Stalin had an article uh, in a, a Russian Bolshevik newspaper on December the 1st. Uh, uh, he said on, in Pravda on December the 4th, saying mountainous Karabakh will be Armenian. Uh, but then there were negotiations uh, in July of 1920 and uh, the 1921, and the decision taken by the Caucasian Bureau of the Communist Party, Kav Bureau, on July the 4th was reversed on July the 5th. Uh, and Karabakh uh, was attributed to, linked with Azerbaijan. And slowly, uh, we, I have maps, Soviet maps of that period. At first, Karabakh was linked territorially with Armenia at a village known as Der. Uh, and then it is progressively detached from Armenia and becomes an enclave within Azerbaijan. Complaints start in the 1920s by Armenians. They start shutting up during the Stalinian terror. Under Khrushchev and, uh, you know, the Tho, uh, complaints again. And then revival of complaints in the late 1980s with a letter sent to Gorbachev. Uh, rejection of that letter because the Soviet constitution had contradictory clauses one giving preference to uh, self-determination and the other one saying that both republics have to agree to self-determination. And this led to nationalistic movements in Karabakh and in Armenia and then in Azerbaijan to the Azerbaijani Popular uh, Front. And this is the backdrop of the problem, a problem that was a territorial administrative problem became an ethnic problem with the Sumgai pogroms uh, at the end of February 1988. Uh, and it reminded Armenians of the genocide uh, uh, background. Uh, and the struggle continued with the Russians apparently backing the Azerbaijanis until approximately 19, uh, towards the end of 1991. Uh, and then shifting sides when uh, Mr. El Chibe uh, played a prominent role in Azerbaijan, the leader of the Popular Front, who was rapidly anti-Russian and pro-Turkish. And then its Armenian victories uh, and territorial uh, gains. Uh, those territorial gains did not translate into a peace treaty, but a ceasefire in 1994, and then international negotiations that remain totally uh, uh, fruitless. Uh, the parties couldn't even agree on the basic principles of the settlement, let alone the details of the settlement. These basic principles are called the Madrid principles. Eh? And until the beginning of the war, they couldn't even agree on those. I think if you allow me one more minute, I would like to mention those Madrid principles as a background, Carol, with your permission. If not, I am satisfied with this extremely concise background. You can also May I go ahead and read that half, uh, you know, the one third of a page, the Madrid principles? We yeah. can do it now or we can do it part of the um, the comment period. Let me do it now because it might be helpful to my, for my colleagues, you know, Joshua, Rauf, and so on. So those principles that had been negotiated ad nauseam uh, were the following ones and they were revealed at the meeting of uh, uh, President Obama, Russian President Medvedev, and French President Sarkozy at L'Aquila 
in 2009. The basic principle reflect a reasonable compromise based on the Helsinki Final Act, principles of non-use of force, territorial integrity, and the equal rights and self-determination of people. The basic principle call inter alia, for return of the territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijani control, an interim status for Nagorno-Karabakh providing guarantees for security and self-governance, a corridor linking Armenia to Nagorno-Karabakh, future determination of the final legal status of Nagorno-Karabakh through a legally bound, binding expression of will, the right of all internally displaced persons and refugees to return to their former residences, places of residence and international security guarantees that would include a peacekeeping operation. Now, the reason this document failed was because there was disagreement very clearly around the following issue. Uh, uh, the sequence of the operations, the issue of the future determination of the legal status through an expression of will, and the territorial definition of Nagorno-Karabakh once that referendum had taken place. In particular, future determination. What does that mean uh, in terms of timing? In three years after the territories have, re have been returned, in 15 years, never. Uh, that was an issue for the Armenians. Uh, the expression, uh, expression of will refers to whom? The Armenian population left in Nagorno-Karabakh the Armenian population plus the Azerbaijani refugees in Azerbaijan from Nagorno-Karabakh, the whole of the Azerbaijani population, that was also uh, unclear. And what was the territorial definition of Nagorno-Karabakh since the letter, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Oblast disappeared from the Azerbaijani constitution in 1995. Uh, so uh, these were some of the issues, they weren't settled and for various reasons that are extremely clear, in particular the Russian goal of coming to that area with its peacekeepers, uh, collaboration probably with Turkey uh, or a modicum of agreement. Uh, a war took place just at the time when the US was engulfed in the debates and controversies of the American presidential election. And I think I would like to thank you for your patience. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Trying to outline what is a very complicated historical fabric that pervades this conflict. Our next speaker, Ralph Mamadov. Yeah, I will be speaking for a more shorter period of time because uh, Professor Asturian was uh, so descriptive in, in all aspects of the conflict. and um, But I'll be speaking more about the geopolitical context and the environment that uh, the, the war actually took place and, and the, uh, the developments that led to the war took place. Well, 2020 for everyone was uh, remembered and still is remembered for, for the pandemic. So pandemic was the most important uh, geopolitical uh, event in that year. And it had uh, definite implications for um, for the major countries in, in the region, for the, uh, for the regional leaders, key players for Russia, Iran, Turkey. And it had uh, implications for, for specifically for Azerbaijan and, and Turkey and Armenia as well. Um, then another, important uh, development that uh, that had its impact on the on, on the conflict as well um, was of course the the trend process of the transition in the United States the presidential elections the processes leading to the presidential elections and the um, the, the modus operandi the the strategy of the countries including the regional countries especially the regional countries such as Iran and and Russia uh, their expectations from the elections um, that was uh, that, uh, and uh, the um, uh, the processes around the the elections and 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 the transition uh, to a new president, to new administration, um, 
I, I believe uh, it played an important role in in throughout the conflict, uh, and how the the countries, uh, the Western countries, and uh, the regional countries reacted to the conflict. Um, the 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 major players in the region, such as Russia, Iran, and Turkey, they had their own issues on the plate, and that that they have been dealing with. Uh, for Russia, it was uh, mainly the Belarus elections and their support to um, to the uh, to the reigning president Lukashenko. Uh, as you know, the elections took place in August, and the whole world was were close to watching how how will things evolve in Belarus and how Russia will react to it. Uh, and and uh, Putin was largely preoccupied uh, with that. Another issue that was rush on Russia's plate is still on Russia's plate, and this is right up my alley, this is in the energy field, uh, is the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, Russia uh, was has been building this major export outlet to, the, um, to Europe, uh, which is almost 30% dependent on Russian gas, and it's it was, it has, it was a major milestone for Russia to finish the uh, the, pro uh, the project by 2020, and uh, it was uh, receiving uh, backlash from mainly from the Washington and Brussels. It's still uh, receiving, and in Eastern Europe from Poland, and um, and Putin was preoccupied. He's still actually preoccupied with that as well. Uh, for for other countries such as Iran, of course, the pandemic uh, was hit Iran very bad, and Iran was still recovering from that. And also uh, for Iran, uh, extremely important matter was um, the the elections in the United States and how uh, will these uh, elections end, and what will be the future of the uh, Iranian United. States relations and also uh, subsequently Iranian relations with the rest of the world and especially with the Europe. Um, another uh, important uh, issue for Iran was um, its relations with uh, with uh, with the regional countries. But I'll come to that um, later. Uh, the Turkey was. Um, Mainly for Turkey, it's it was mainly about the Eastern Mediterranean and how. Um, it was a continuation of Turkey's uh, policies in, in Ismet and in, in general. And um, Turkey, uh, if you remember, Turkey uh, was um, confronting Greece. And um, so it's uh, the main focus of Turkey was, was there. But um, coming uh, to, to the region, uh, I guess the most important development for region, especially for Azerbaijan, uh, which was which, if you asked me before September 27th, if 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 are you expecting any war in 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 the region, I would say it's highly un unlikely because there are major projects are being commissioned in the in the region, and you know one would one would expect uh, stability and in the region for those projects to be commissioned. And that project for Azerbaijan was the Southern Gas Corridor project, and um, the the 40 billion dollar project was uh, was about to be finished. It was. It was a long process of more than 10 years uh, that they've been trying to bring that project to fruition. And um, eventually, uh, the war actually started three, four months before the, um, the, the commissioning of the pipeline. Uh, that, those were the events leading to the, um, uh, to the war. Uh, I'm not going to touch about the war because I think much has been discussed about it, but I want to talk, talk more about what happened after the war and what this, does this uh, peace agreement mean for the regional geopolitics. Um, if you ask who, who was the winner of, 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 from the war, of course, Azerbaijan is, uh, restored uh, its sovereignty over part of its territory, most of the uh, lost territory during the first war. Um, Azerbaijan had uh, another development is that the geopolitical development is that Azerbaijan finally uh, uh, has uh, obtained an access, uh, a land access to its exclave Nakhchivan, which uh, enables Azerbaijan to to serve as a transit from the Caspian up to Turkey and uh, creates a major infrastructure route through there. Uh, but the, there were also other winners as well. And of course, Armenia was, the, uh, was on the losing side for the obvious reasons, uh, but uh, Russia and Turkey were the other winners from the war. Uh, Russia has, um, first of all, Russia preserved its um, uh, sole Role as a as an arbiter of the of the of the conflict, it did play with um, the OSC uh, format. It allowed OSC format the uh, the Minsk group to um, 
to have those ceasefires, which were um, futile, they, they were not in effect for, for less than an hour. Um, they, he, Putin and Kremlin managed to uh, hold the process, conduct the process within the OSC format, but at the, at the last minute, uh, they hijacked the process, the, the agreement process, and uh, made it without the OSC, and that uh, enabled Russia to uh, to have its peacekeepers on the ground. Because accor according to the Minsk Group rules, um, the the co-chairman can were not were not um, allowed to have their peacekeepers, and by hijacking this um, uh, this format and by being a sole um, referee in the in the in the negotiation process and and eventually in the peace agreement it managed to first of all to um to have uh, its peacekeepers um on the ground um russia also managed for the first time since the collapse of the soviet union to have troops and military base although it's it's a it's a small base it's more like monitoring center but still uh it's a contingency they have uh, now troops in Azerbaijan proper in the territory of Karabakh, which has never been, it hadn't, was not subject to, to the World War, uh, to the um, Nagorno-Karabakh War, Second Karabakh War. And, um, and, and now they have um, uh, troops there. Uh, another winner, of course, the Turkey. Of course, Russia was playing um, for Russia. Uh, it, was a, it was a challenging uh, task to uh, co-opt Turkey and at the same time to make sure that Turkey is not the part of the, uh, the peace agreement process and which would uh, inevitably uh, may allow uh, Turkey to have its troops as, a, as, as peacekeepers as well. Uh, it managed, uh, Russia managed to put, uh, to, to keep Turkey out of that process, but at the same time, Turkey managed to uh, Ankara uh, finally had uh, managed to, uh, to go back to the uh, South Caucasus, and now they have a joint uh, monitoring center in uh, in Agdam, Azerbaijan. Um, so these are the countries who uh, who have won um, from the conflict. But these these victories are are of course are not final. It's a it's 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 important to understand that it's a very dynamic process, and um, although. Uh, Russia is in the middle of uh, of the um, of all the negotiations that are going on between, unfortunately, between Tur between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. They are the one who are regulating it. Um, there, there has already been some some progresses in um, in in opening of the infrastructure, and that has led to a thinking that maybe in the future, if Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, can come to a certain agreement, then there will be no need for for other place to be there. Uh, one of that development, of course, is the um, uh, the as I mentioned the 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 access uh, that was granted by Armenia to Azerbaijan, uh, and also the another development is um, uh, finally, although trilaterally between Armenia, Russia, uh, Russia, and Azerbaijan, but finally the sites have been started discussing the infrastructure project and opening the roads. Uh, one other development that take, took place after the, uh, after the, um, the peace agreement, ceasefire agreement that I think needs to be mentioned from the energy perspective is that um, for the first time since the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, Azerbaijan transited uh, energy commodity through Armenia, the gas through uh, to, to Armenia through its territory. That uh, you know all the uh, connection, all the communication lines were lost after the war, and this was the first time that uh, on Russia's request, because of the uh, Russia's main supply lines go to Georgia and they had repair works there, uh, for the uh, they requested from Azerbaijan to provide that uh, transit through. Um, through uh, through Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan agreed. As I mentioned, as I've mentioned it in my uh, articles before, uh, it it might uh, derive from from a technical necessity, but it shows that there is that potential. And um, what I observe from 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 Azerbaijani perspective is that the uh, Azerbaijan looks at it um, the post conflict process. First of all, Azerbaijan believes that the conflict is already over. And the Baku also believes that uh, now that the conflict is over and all these communication lines are unfrozen, it's a, it provides Azerbaijan and, and the region with a good opportunity to connect the um, uh, transportation projects from east to west and north to south. And uh, hopefully that will uh, uh, will contribute, that thinking will eventually contribute uh, to, to realization of the projects. 
uh, but of course there are there are a lot of challenges and and uh, you know I believe uh, my colleagues will talk about them. Thank you very much for that outline. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Tanoyan. Uh, hello and good evening, and I would like to thank uh, Tamara and Carol and Corbell Center for organizing this talk. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be among such distinguished colleagues and try to put my <clears throat> proverbial two cents in or whatever it's worth. Um, so my, my research is uh, multifaceted on the conflict, but <clears throat> for the uh, for the reasons of this uh, evening's uh, conversation, I would like to focus on, on the religious aspects of the conflict. Now, before I say anything else, uh, there are a couple of caveats that need to be said. And every time I speak about the religious aspects of the conflict, I sort of feel compelled uh, to give uh, an apologia pro vita sua, a defense of my own life as to why a conflict that is widely perceived to be over territory uh, invites uh, analysis that figures in religion or religious rhetoric and so on and so forth. So having said that, I would like to say that I do not believe the conflict is religious. Uh, and by what do I mean by saying that is that the war is not fought over religious ideals. The war is not fought over uh, religious shrines or uh, or so on and so forth. The war is not fought over uh, for uh, attempts to convert one side or the other uh, to one's religion. The war is not fought over. Uh, it is not a jihad or a Christian uh, crusade. So having said that, what am I trying to understand in the conflict? So as a, by training, I'm a sociologist of religion. I trained under a, a sociologist of religion. You may uh, or may not have heard Peter Berger from Boston University, who wrote a, very, a couple of very interesting books on, on, on the sociological aspects of religion and, and the role of religion in society and so on and so forth. So ha having been sort of cooked in Peter Berger's kitchen, uh, there are things that uh, always catches my eyes when I look at things. And one of the things that I concentrate on is try to understand what, in what form, in what shape uh, does religion come into comp in play in this conflict in particular. Now, uh, to say that there is an anecdote that I would like to sort of say. Uh, there's this joke, it's Belfast, uh, 1980s, uh, there's a stick up situation, a guy comes with a gun uh, and a criminal comes with a gun and holds up this person and says, quick, quick, are you a Protestant or are you a Catholic? And the person says, well, I'm neither, I'm an atheist says, yes, but that doesn't count. Are you a Catholic atheist or a Protestant atheist? So, so the conflict, when we talk about the Armenian and Azerbaijani conflict in this regard, we're not talking about a purely religious motivation. We're talking about religion as something of a cultural component and something that gives meaning to people's lives. And when I look at this conflict, I, in, in of necessity when you study the history of the conflict and its origins in 1980s and so on and so forth, uh, there were several things that were happening uh, when the conflict for, first rose. Of course, it was Armenian aspirations and Armenian nationalist aspirations that sort of jump-started the process of the conflict. But as the conflict developed, it started developing uh, certain religious undertones. Uh, in the beginning of the conflict, uh, a friend of mine, Felix Corley, a British researcher, says uh, he had traced only one, uh, uh, only one that was present during the mass demonstrations in Yerevan. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the first several weeks of the uh, mass demonstrations that were happening in Yerevan. The conflict went on. 
religious symbolism, religious rhetoric, and more and more clergy started participating in public demonstrations. Uh, you started seeing uh, imagery that was uh, my internet, uh, uh, imagery that was religious and so on and so forth. I'm reminded when I look at the issues, I'm reminded a uh, quote by uh, G.K. Chesterton, and it says, uh, it doesn't matter what starts religion, uh, what starts wars is, is what sustains it. It, in many cases, is a matter of the soul, and it is a matter of religion. And so the conflict, as the conflict went on, religion became uh, more and more uh, instrumentalized, if you will, religion was called upon to uh, uh, legitimize first the powers that were, and then secondly, to legitimize. It is, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it, uh, it's difficult to send young men to their deaths for material purposes. There needs to be something uh, that is greater than them, a cause that is greater than them, uh, for which they will be willing to uh, to live for and to die for. And in the conflict, though it never developed uh, a self uh, sort of propellant religious dynamic, the the uh, the religious aspects were uh, fairly available and fairly uh, ready to legitimize the conflict uh, for the Armenian uh, young people that were fighting and for Azerbaijani young people that were fighting. And so that is sort of the thing that I'm trying to understand in my, in my research. Um, I have several papers uh, that I have working, worked on, uh, quotations from religious figures and so on and so forth, trying to motivate uh, the population and uh, try to bring issues and try to formulate the conflict as sort of uh, having a religious greater than yourself dimension. And, and the other thing that uh, kept in mind is that when we talk about religious aspects, uh, when we talk about religion, people of necessity start thinking uh, uh, one dimensional. It, it is such a loaded word that everybody has an opinion about it. And when you talk about religious aspects of conflict, immediately the first thing that comes to mind, this, this person is to uh, portray a conflict over territory as religious, which is, not, uh, which is not my purpose. So I'm just looking forward to uh, some questions when uh, people have, and I'll just stop here. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Tonoyan. So now um, what's going to happen is I'm going to share my screen so I can play the video that Arzu Gebula ended up um, preparing for us. Good afternoon. My name is Arzu Gebula. I'm a journalist from Azerbaijan, currently based in Istanbul, Turkey, from where I continue covering the country and the region as a freelance journalist and editor. I would like to apologize for not joining you live today due to time difference, but I do hope my comments leave you with some understanding of challenges of reporting on the war and the overall environment of media freedom and human rights in Azerbaijan. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. The panel organizers have my contacts. I think a good place to start from is by explaining the media landscape in Azerbaijan. Broadly speaking, it is divided into several groups. You have the government owned media, which is obviously owned by the government institutions, um, the ruling party of Azerbaijan. You have the pro-government media, which is owned by individuals who are closely affiliated with the government officials or government institutions. You have independent media, you have the opposition media and the exiled media. 
Now, independent media, when I, when I say independent media, I think I really need to clarify that in the context of Azerbaijan, um, independent media isn't really recognized as such because often the way the government of Azerbaijan perceives independent journalism is still as anti-government or opposition. And so any kind of reporting that's critical of um, specific government decisions, policies, developments, it's often perceived as um, anti-government. And this goes for the international coverage as well. And often this type of um, description, this type of um, evaluation of independent journalism leads to unsubstantiated criticism, such as these individuals represent foreign interests, so they are on a payroll of foreign interests, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, for the opposition media, I think it's quite clear from, from the name, it is um, often affiliated with the opposition groups, and movements and whatnot, and the exile media is um, a more of a recent trend. It was, most of it was founded by either journalists or activists who fled the country as a result of persecution. Um, and it is also divided, uh, I would say, into two groups, the independent exiled media platforms and the opposition exiled media platforms. At least this was how the division um, existed before the war. During the Second Karabakh War, these divisions mostly disappeared, with an exception of one or two exiled media platforms. Much of civil society, including the moderate voices, supported the government's decision to launch the military offensive. This, as a result, led to divisions between anti-war and pro-war groups in the country. For journalists working for Azerbaijani media and covering the war, there was only one story to tell, our story. Foreign journalists allowed into both countries were subject to a different kind of harassment. They were, they were often showered with accusations of biased journalism. And it didn't really matter if they were biased or not. As long as the scale in the story was slightly tilted towards one side in the conflict, that was enough for blame game to begin. And this is not to say all foreign coverage was ideal during the war. I remember catching one BBC report um, that talked about destruction caused by Azerbaijani military on Armenian civilian settlements, but the footage was actually from Azerbaijan, from Azerbaijani city that did suffer during the war, uh, the city of Genja. The video was later removed from BBC. So sure, there were mistakes, uh, but I don't think it gave ground for targeting on the scale we saw during the Karabakh War, during the Second Karabakh War. There's one other point I would like to make about journalism perceptions in Azerbaijan. And this is about where you as a journalist, as an individual, stand on Armenia-Azerbaijan relations and the conflict itself. I've supported dialogue and the peace initiatives and was often critical of lack of progress in the dialogue between the leaders of the two countries and third parties involved, such as the OEC Minsk Group. We knew very little of the meetings that were taking place behind closed doors because they were never uh, publicized. Only joint statements would be made public after those meetings took place. And once the leaders went back to their respective countries, the overall narrative was the same. Nothing really changed. But it wasn't just that. You know, declining state of political, social, and economic freedoms all added to the frustration of the civil society in Azerbaijan. So if before the war, reporting on these issues, reporting on the lack of progress in the dialogue process was considered normal, during the war, suddenly, all of the criticism had to stop. There was no room for that because the country was at war, and anyone who dared to mention the issues that were at stake before the war were immediately ostracized. During the war, I worked with CNN International, but I also continued writing in my capacity as a freelance journalist. Naturally, I was critical of the government's decision to go into war. And although the military power of Azerbaijan was stronger than of Armenia's, at the end of the day, I couldn't come to terms that in the modern age of diplomacy and dialogue, young men on both sides of the conflict were giving their lives for something their respective leaders failed to achieve in the decades, in the last three decades, pretty much. Yes, Azerbaijan won the war, but at what cost and for what long-term implications? I was told during the war um, that things would change, 
once the war is over, things there will be um, progress. And this was voiced to me by the moderate representatives of Azerbaijan's civil society, who actually during the war wholeheartedly supported the war. They said their support for the war was not to be confused with their support of the government. I thought at the time, as I think today, that this was what they told themselves. The last five months since the war has ended has shown no such change is nowhere in sight. If anything, emboldened with the victory in the second war, the country's leadership have tightened the screws on freedoms even further, while little work has been done to address social and economic grievances. So for me, it was an interesting experience covering the second war. Because of my views, I was labeled a traitor, a sellout, and many other things. And I wasn't the only one. Anyone who made anti-war statements were harassed and targeted. Suddenly, we were all labeled as part of Armenian propaganda, referring to any international reporting critical of the government of Azerbaijan, making comments about human rights violations during the war were off limits. All those reports were lies and they should not have been mentioned during the war. There was no sign of conflict sensitive reporting, no sign of independent journalism. And I can say this for both um, Azerbaijan and Armenia, more or less. There was also no censoring in terms of graphic content, including killings, ill treatment of civilian population and military and combat by both sides. When one side tried to address the damage caused inflicted on both ends as a result of the war, this reporting was often lost in the noise of nationalists who kept comparing the losses. Our pain was greater than yours. Our loss was bigger than yours. The media content was dominated by official statements and reports provided by the respective ministries of defense and any other relevant government institutions. This created a very one-sided coverage, often with provocative headlines dominating the news feed. The media on each side of the conflict tried to tell their own story. Additional measures taken by both governments further complicated the coverage of the war in both countries. Armenia prohibited government, uh, Armenia imposed um, any limitation on uh, content that was critical of the government. They also gave powers to the police who could hand out fines and remove content that they deemed um, was critical of the government. In Azerbaijan, foreign journalists who were traveling to the country to cover the war were um, signed, were given minders. Um, and also uh, in Azerbaijan, the government imposed internet disruptions that started on September 27th, the day uh, when the military offensive began and ended on November 12th. This was the longest internet disruption observed in the country to this day. Access to social media platforms was blocked, internet speeds were slowed down. In the meantime, these internet disruptions didn't affect state media agencies, government institutions, Ministry of Defense, uh, who kept updating their websites and their telegram channels with news from the front line. So when in November 10, an agreement between the sides of the conflict was reached and it was announced that Russia will officially have its boots on the ground, I immediately thought of Russia's similar presence in Georgia and Ukraine. I also remembered 1990 when Soviet tanks rolled over demonstrators in Baku. In my view, while the agreement did end hostilities, its wider implications are yet to be seen. I see it as a strategic boon for Russia. I will end my comments here. I'm sorry I went a little over time. And once again, I apologize, I cannot be there in person, but I really do hope you enjoyed the rest of the discussion and the panel, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. So now we're going to hear from Joshua Kuchera, um, who is going to provide a different kind of additional framing on what Arzu said and some of the comments of our panelists. Mr. Kuchera. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I, uh, I, I can more or less uh, sign off uh, entirely on what Arzu said about the, the Azerbaijani and the international uh, media coverage of the war. 
Um, it's a shame that we don't have an Armenian journalist to kind of fill in the picture uh, on that side. Uh, but I can try my best. And if any of the other uh, participants want to add anything from their perspective, uh, they should do so. Um, overall, the dynamic that Arzu described in Azerbaijan uh, was roughly the same thing that happened in Armenia. The, the coverage was very monolithic. There was a very strong rallying around the flag uh, effect, and no one was critical of the government's actions uh, during the war. Um, there are, of course, important distinctions. Anybody who follows Azerbaijan understands that it's one of the most uh, restrictive media environments in the world. Uh, Armenia is not at that level, uh, but the picture, the media picture there is still not good. Um, one difference from Azerbaijan is that you do have a very uh, politicized media in Armenia. You have uh, a lot of the media, probably the majority, are in fact very critical of the government uh, because they are uh, loyal to, controlled by uh, members of the uh, former regime that this current government uh, ousted in 2018. Uh, and then you have a smaller portion of the media that's uh, very that's pro-government. Um, overall, though, it's an extremely politicized uh, media environment with little independent uh, serious journalism. Uh, but as in Azerbaijan is polarized uh, as the situation was uh, before the war, as soon as the fighting started, uh, the media more or less put their differences aside and did not question anything that the government was doing. Um, all media uncritically uh, repeated the claims of the military and defense leadership um, about uh, the conduct of the war, which uh, was uh, misleading, overly optimistic. Uh, about how the fighting was going. And so when uh, Armenia announced that it was surrendering, uh, it came as a bigger shock um, than it should have had the press been uh, more critical. Uh, in any case, once the, once the fighting start, stopped, uh, the gloves of the, the anti-government press came off uh, fairly quickly. Uh, and since then, the media in Armenia has been, again, full of stories very critical of the, the government. Uh, focused on its conduct of the war. Uh, some of these reports are justified, many of them are not. Um, but anyway, again, the, the situation is uh, highly politicized, highly combative, uh, while still not being uh, independent, truly independent or, or at all serious media. Um, another nuance in the Armenian media scene that you don't see in the Azerbaijani scene is that there are a number of outlets there run uh, by and for the, the large Armenian diaspora. Um, these outlets tend to be, uh, by regional standards, very high quality uh, in terms of the production value. The writing is good. They have real on-the-ground reporting, uh, but they still provide an entirely one-sided uh, nationalist view of the conflict. Um, Arzu alluded to this. Um, obviously, it goes without saying that in Azerbaijan, you never heard uh, the Armenian point of view in this war. Uh, but uh, also in, in Armenia's somewhat freer environment, you also absolutely never hear the Azerbaijani perspective uh, presented. Um, I'll, I'll expand also a little bit on what Arzu said about the international coverage of the war. Um, this is a coverage, this is a war, a conflict that had been almost entirely uncovered uh, by the world media before fighting broke out in September. Uh, so when the war started, you had immediately a lot of journalists uh, parachuting in from other parts of the world uh, almost none of whom knew anything about uh, the conflict and were forced to learn on the fly uh, in a very difficult environment. Um, obviously, the results were not always successful, uh, but as time went on, I think the, the coverage got better and uh, you did see uh, ultimately some, some really high quality journalism uh, coming from out of the conflict. Uh, nevertheless, as Arsu said, um, there, was, there was really very strong pressure on uh, international journalists from both sides uh, to tell only their particular side of the story. Um, I can explain a little bit about Eurasianet, the publication I work for. Uh, we cover the Caucasus in Central Asia, which is a region that is really very rarely covered by uh, serious English language media. Uh, so we kind of occupy a space in between the international and local media. Um, our editors are all foreigners. Um, all of us have expertise, um, experience uh, working in, in bigger international media, but we are based in the region. We've worked there for a long time. Uh, and we also have local correspondents from every country, including Armenians and Azerbaijanis uh, who, who also report for us. 
Uh, I myself uh, am based in Georgia and Tbilisi, although at the moment I'm, I'm in the US. Uh, during the war, I spent about a month uh, in Armenia. Uh, I wasn't allowed into Azerbaijan. I also wasn't allowed uh, into Karabakh itself. Um, but while I was in Armenia, I, I met a lot of the, the international journalists who had come, come through. Um, and it really struck me, two of them in particular, from two of the, the biggest name outlets you can think of. I, I, I won't name them. These were off the record conversations. But both told me that this was the most um, aggressive media environment that they had covered, that they and their editors uh, had never seen the level of anger that they got from readers, uh, from, from Armenians and Azerbaijanis uh, over their coverage. Um, anyway, so once the, the fighting stopped, uh, very soon uh, the international coverage uh, disappeared almost entirely. Uh, there are very few exceptions. The BBC is a notable one. They continue to do fairly good um, reports occasionally from, from the post-war situation. Uh, but other than that, it's more or less uh, totally dropped off the world media map. So uh, I'll end there and uh, happy to answer any questions about the media. Thank you. I think amongst all of our speakers and then um, what Arzu has pre pre prepared for us is we have this very layered and complicated historical, geopolitical, um, thinking about religion as um, Dr. Tanoyan has said in terms of how it's being instrumentalized actually and used as a framing device. And then thinking about this media landscape so right now I would actually like to give some time to each of our presenters. If you would like to make a comment or an addition to any of your colleagues' statements. Do you like to do that? If not, I'm going to jump in with a question actually. And this might be directed towards Dr. Asturian, but I think at the same time, um, it's open to all of the speakers. And that is thinking about this historical backdrop a little bit more, sort of fleshing it out. Because what all of you have been talking about is the ways in which borders are being used or utilized or claims being made to borders. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more, Dr. Asturian, in terms of the position that the Soviets played specifically in the Transcaucasus region post 1917, in which that framework of drawing the borders in a different way by different actors than what you started to express in the 19th century, and then hearkening back to a much larger, richer historical fabric of greater Armenia. And so this also speaks to emergent nationalist uh, Azerbaijani framings of how they understand um, these borders. And so I, I was hoping that you could take us through that a little bit more. Yeah. Can you hear me now, I guess? You can yes. hear me, yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry. There are at least two dimensions, you know, uh, to uh, that question, uh, at least, uh, but we don't have uh, the whole day. So uh, the first one is uh, uh, how borders uh, were defined within the early Soviet period, you know. Okay. Uh, and let me take the specific example of mountainous Karabakh. You know, that is exactly our topic today. Uh, 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 how come that the CAV Bureau, the Caucasian Bureau of the Communist Party, uh, uh, decides essentially on July the 4th to attribute mountainous Karabakh to uh, uh, Armenia? Uh, the next day, uh, Stalin seems to have intervened. I use seems on purpose. Uh, and uh, the position is reversed. Uh, earlier than that, at the time of the Sovietization of Armenia, Nariman Narimanovich, uh, Narimanov, you know, uh, has a statement, he's the top Bolshevik leader of Azerbaijan, uh, saying in a fraternal gesture, we are uh, 
uh, we agree to give Karabakh, you know, a mountainous Karabakh to uh, the Armenians. Stalin writes an article in Pravda on December the 4th, uh, saying the same thing, and then everything changes. So, how, what is the motivation? Uh, let me tell you, there is no clear consensus because there are several uh, historiographic schools in uh, Soviet history. The dominant one in academia be, being the pseudo-liberal uh, leftist, American-style leftist, uh, rosy Marxist uh, version of it. Uh, 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 you know, so uh, uh, coming from France, you know, I know what is left, what is extreme left, and what is rosy left, you know, uh, and so on. Uh, I grew up in a, in a period when uh, Maoists were all over the place in my area, uh, Trotskyites and so on. So, you know, uh, uh, I know what is left. Uh, so, uh, this, is, this is the statement of the CAF Bureau. Uh, considering the necessity of national harmony between Muslims and Armenians, the economic linkage between Upper and Lower Karabakh and its mountainous permanent ties to Azerbaijan. We are attributing mountainous Karabakh to Azerbaijan. Now, uh, I have copies of Soviet documents, uh, 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 published Soviet documents, uh, which show that very clearly there is another motivation uh, the Bolsheviks' collaboration with the Kemalist Turks at that time. Uh, you know, against the West, uh, uh, and uh, 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 and the Kemalist Turks support for their brethren in the Caucasus. You know, for for the uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, there is another concern uh, attributing mountainous Karabakh to Armenia could have potentially destabilized uh, a Muslim. Uh, Soviet Republic, and the Bolsheviks had in mind that they could even collaborate with Turkey. Uh, Turkey had the potential of going, uh, of becoming a leftist country, uh, even, uh, you know, Mustafa Kemal even created a kind of uh, uh, communist movement in Turkey at that time. Uh, so there were Bolshevik dreams, you know, in that uh, direction. Uh, some uh, historians have uh, uh, put into question uh, what I have uh, just said, uh, and uh, they think that Bolsheviks were not uh, inclined at that time uh, to carry out a policy of divide and rule, which is the view of Soviet Armenian historians, but more of consolidating and ruling, putting together groups, uh, and uh, they viewed linking mountainous Karabakh to Azerbaijan as something that made sense economically. Why not? Uh, in that case, if that were true, uh, consolidating and ruling, how come they put Nakhichevan, the area south, of Yerevan, they attributed to Azerbaijan, even though it was an exclave of Azerbaijan. It's cut from Azerbaijan. It has no, it had no economic clear ties with Azerbaijan at that time. So how can they explain this contradiction, these historians? You know. Uh, <laughs> uh, finally, there is a younger scholar who wrote a thesis. Uh, about various, uh, my, uh, you know, minority areas and their policies. Uh, I don't know what to say. His view is that uh, uh, the difficult access uh, from Armenia to that region and poor communication with mountainous Karabakh was a key factor, uh, along with the agrarian economy, that is, uh, Azerbaijani shepherds going up and down the hills to the plains of Karabakh. Uh, it will take some effort to convince me that uh, at night, uh, Josip Stalin was uh, mainly concerned with Azerbaijani shepherds uh, in that area. I mean, it will take some effort uh, to convince me about that. Uh, you know, uh, 
but we have this type of historians these days. So in a nutshell, there is no consensus. My view is that indeed there was a policy of divide and rule to better control. Georgia is also a case of managing minority com conflicts by creating administrative subdivisions. Look at Abkhazia, South Ossetia. There was also Ajaria. Now Abkhazia, South Ossetia are pseudo-independent under Russian control. Uh, one thing is very clear now that we live 100 years later. There are studies of all the conflicts uh, in the early post-Soviet period and post-Soviet period in general. Almost all of them are correlated, linked with territorial units. That is, the moment you create those territorial units with ethnic minorities, in the long term, this is where the et ethno-territorial conflict takes place. Hmm? That is, diluted minority population without an administrative unit named after them. Okay, there are almost no cases of conflict hmm, in that situation. Uh, I don't know if I am clear, but th that is uh, the fact. Uh, let me move to the second dimension. I don't want to give a lecture. The second dimension of the Bolshevik policy, Soviet policy, was historiography. Stalin promoted a type of historiography whereby every single national group, you had to create a history to literally root them in the territory that had been given to them. Hmm? So you had to create a linear history going back almost to prehistory, you know, to antiquity, and showing that that group and its forefathers evolved, you know, continuously from late antiquity to the present eh, on that land. Hmm? So in the case of Azerbaijan, and the, uh, you, you know, I know uh, Azerbaijani historians uh, and the political system gets irritated. To, be, uh, to me, uh, if you are a younger nation, that doesn't mean you are an inferior nation. The UN is filled with nations that didn't, states that didn't exist 150 years ago, you know. If we are to adopt that attitude, and I see it sometimes in Armenia, you know, okay, the, you know, we are an old nation. Okay, so, so what, you know, uh, uh, so that's not the perspective from which I am speaking. Hmm? Uh, so Azerbaijanis, like other nations, were given a history going back to antiquity, uh, starting in late Soviet time with a kingdom of Manna, uh, then moving to Caucasian Albanians, then the Caucasian Albanians became Christian essentially because of their uh, of Armenian influence. Uh, then they were absorbed in the Armenian church. Uh, then apparently in that historiography, they merged with the Muslim populations that had moved to the Caucasus from the 11th century onward, you know, Turkic Muslim Mongol populations, uh, and out of that came the Azerbaijani nation that had been continuously present on the territory of what became Soviet Azerbaijan. It's as if in US historiography, despite all of, all of its defects, you know, 40 years, 50 years ago, uh, uh, totally neglecting Native Americans, uh, slavery, and so on, okay, it's as if there had been uh, uh, a historiography had been developed whereby uh, uh, the pilgrims, the uh, wasps who arrived, you know, uh, to North America somehow had merged with Native Americans eh? and thus were autochthonous populations of North America. You see what I mean? Eh? Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, the Soviets encouraged this type of historiography. And one of the ironies, actually, is that when you study the historiography in uh, uh, Soviet times of Azerbaijan, uh, uh, that historiography has been used in the post-Soviet period for, ironically enough, it's a remnant of the Soviet period that has been used 
for nationalistic purposes, uh, whereas actually it is a Soviet product uh, coming from the policies of uh, essentially uh, Stalin. So that type of historiography is also one of the causes uh, of the uh, ethno-territorial problems uh, that have emerged in the post-Soviet uh, space. And I will stop here. Thank you very, very much. Uh, moving forward, I want to be conscious of time because we have some very rich questions to direct towards our speakers. Um, Tamara, would you like me to begin or would you like to say something? So, well, I have a, a yeah, no, I, I'll go ahead and jump in because I also have a question. But first, I just want to make sure um, to give an opportunity to any of our other panelists who wanted to respond to Carol's first question. Was, was there anyone else that before I ask an, another question. Okay, so the question that I have um, relates to the various attempts at peace agreements. So we got to hear from Professor Estrain about the Madrid principles, and we also have heard a bit about the peace settlement from November, uh, the ceasefire agreement. And so my question to all of the panelists is, Obviously, there's no perfect agreement, but what what is still missing from from your perspective and the perspective of those that you interact with? What would be the one or two things that would be needed to be added to a durable peace agreement? Can I start? Please. Well, I guess the, the most important issue and the most outstanding issue is the uh, the issue of whether the status of Karabakh has been settled or not. We have heard uh, the, the, the peace agreement, actually, whether it's a it's technically peace agreement or a ceasefire agreement, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I guess it's it's more like a ceasefire agreement. And uh, it, 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 the document itself was so vague and had so many uh, changing parts that it was already promising that uh, it's not going to be an easy process. And, and the, the first uh, formidable issue, of course, is the, the status. Azerbaijani side, since the conflict, uh, President Aliyev has repeatedly uh, mentioned that the conflict is over, the, the war is over, the status of the Nagorno-Karabakh is off the table, and the whole territory of, Azer uh, of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is the part of sovereign Azerbaijan. Although um, it doesn't have a uh, direct uh, reign over the parts of the territory, which is uh, where the Russian peacekeepers are being uh, are are serving now. Uh, that's the the main issue, and then um, of course, that's uh, the perfect peace agreement would be, or peace negotiation uh, would be the perfect scenario would be between directly between Azerbaijan and Armenia without any involvement of any uh, external parties. So the, as, as Professor Asturian has repeatedly mentioned, uh, whoever uh, was the leading power in the region and that part of the, um, the world has been part of all those three empires, uh, uh, Russian, Iran, and Turkish, but all of them in, had, had, had almost a similar uh, policy, which is, uh, divide and rule, divide and emperor. And uh, Russia uh, will be, uh, it, with this role in the region, will be, is, is clear that is interested in remaining there and being a mediator between them. And I think that is, is one of the major obstacles and I will leave it to other, my colleagues to mention. Thank you. So again, two, two most important things. Anyone else? What's missing? Uh, just, uh, uh, I have already talked too much, but I think there is uh, one ingredient also uh, that needs to be uh, recreated, reinstated, or whatever it is. Uh, uh, you, you know, in the past, uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis, whatever the situation, uh, uh, friendship, mild dislike, total dislike, and so on, had lived together. They knew each other. Now, uh, uh, you have a generation of people in Azerbaijan who have grown up in the context of very heavy and uh, armenophobic uh, state-sponsored propaganda. It starts in literally in elementary textbooks. There is an uh, outstanding article in Ab Imperio in, about it uh, and uh, other shorter articles even online. 
Uh, but uh, moving beyond that, uh, uh, the type of resentment I see also now uh, from afar growing in Armenia, you know, uh, towards Azerbaijan. Uh, I am talking about these past few months. Hmm? Uh, uh, earlier on, uh, I didn't, I wasn't seeing that. Uh, there was a kind of a sense of uh, superiority, you know, defense minister claiming if there is a new war this time we go, we take more territories, uh, some uh, pseudo specialist writing on, on news website, you know, uh, we go to Baku, uh, all kinds of fantasies had spread, but I wasn't seeing that poisonous uh, uh, affect, you know, that I have seen in many genocides and mass killing and so on, that deep resentment that existed in Azerbaijan over the past 25 years, the bitterness of the refugees, of the territories lost, uh, plus uh, uh, the indoctrination. Uh, I think uh, in order to have any hope for a stable peace and slowly but surely some uh, a decent relations emerging. After all, I come from France. I know the antagonism with Germany in the 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, uh, you know, in order to change those things, you, you need time, but you also need uh, more contact. Uh, you, need, uh, you need people to get to know a little bit each other, not in the kind of business style uh, I am, I don't know what, type of uh, Western NGO. I am organizing a seminar in Tiflis with uh, uh, five Azerbaijanis, five Armenians, and uh, they will get to know each other. But there needs to be uh, more uh, contact. I don't know how you do it. I am not a president or a prime minister. But without that, uh, I don't see something uh, stable e evolving, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Josh? Or Achom, anything to add? Uh, actually, I was going to say what uh, Stefan said and and reiterate uh, some of the stuff that Raouf said about the status and the biggest Armenian concern, you know, is is existential. Uh, what is going to be the status of the Armenians? Not just what is going to happen in Nagorno-Karabakh as a subject of international negotiations, but what is going to happen to the Armenians as, 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 a, as a people on the territory where they have had continuous presence you know, for, for centuries. Uh, there is a running joke in Armenia. One of the most popular male names in Armenia is Hamlet. Uh, and uh, there was an Armenian nationalist poet of quite some merit uh, who wrote from 60s till her death uh, in the 1990s. Her name is Silva Kaputikian. And, and once they asked, why do you think Armenians are so enamored with the name Hamlet? And she half seriously having jokes said, well, the question to be or not to be has been you know, uh, an Armenian agenda for centuries. And it is probably one, why Armenians have this name is why it's so popular. So the Armenian uh, concern here is is really grave. And as Stefan said, the level of Armenophobia cultivated in the Azerbaijani society is really, really quite unfortunate. I don't know if you have seen the latest news from, uh, from Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan just set up a military park of victory over the Armenians and some of the uh, statues of uh, of Armenian soldiers that had been killed or maimed had been reenacted and recreated and kids have been taken to this place where from a very young age these kids are being socialized to hate the other. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that Armenians are innocent of you know not cultivating sort of resentment towards the Azerbaijanis, resentment towards Turks, but this is in order of magnitude completely different universe. It's, it's absolutely grotesque. And one of the, you know, one of the most unfortunate things is that uh, civil societies that keep our societies, uh, civil society actors that keep our societies sort of on our toes have been nearly completely 
uh, silent on this in Azerbaijan. There is no, I mean, voices of reason have been suppressed. And anybody like Arzuz was saying, anybody that sort of tries to uh, not say anything that is not kosher in, in, according to the Azerbaijani government uh, could be, you know, virtually and oftentimes really bludgeoned uh, for, for taking a position that runs counter to the state propaganda. So when Armenians look at these things, and I'm not saying this, and I'm saying this both as an Armenian uh, and a, a, as a scholar, when I look at these things and I study violence professionally, right? And what causes violence? What are the causes and for the protection of violence and uh, protect, uh, uh, protraction of conflicts? Some of the things that I studied professionally, you know, in graduate school and looked to draw sort of comparisons with other instances and seeing that this happening in real time as if in a laboratory is just really quite heartbreaking and quite unfortunate. And so when Armenians look at this and the question that pops naturally is how can we live together? And one, one way of uh, combating this is probably is uh, that the current Azerbaijani government, uh, which I do not have much hopes about, uh, will just go away and perhaps a more democ democracy-minded government takes its place. I know I sound like Isaac Asimov uh, in a fantasy land, but uh, something like that would probably uh, sort of calm the tensions, I don't know, uh, offer an opportunity, a door, uh, a portal to a different world, a portal to a much better future. Um, okay, yeah. And that, so thank you. Thank you um, for those thoughts. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Carol for the next question. I actually, um, I'm scrolling down and I, I wanna pose a question that takes up this idea of violence actually. Um, the question is posed by Noah Sobek. He asks, to what extent do the natural resources and wealth of the region function to perpetuate violence or to prevent effective peace processes? And can I also just tag on to that and, and make that um, how, because there's another question that asks to what degree those, do those resources offer opportunities? Um, so maybe we can ask about both the conflict potential and the opportunities from those natural resources. Well, I think natural resources is, is my field, so I'll, I'll uh, weigh in on that. Um, <clears throat> Well, of course, natural resources is what contributed to the wealth and economic superiority and military superiority of Azerbaijan uh, in the second war. Uh, if you compare it with the first war, uh, the, uh, the oil fields and gas fields of Azerbaijan were not being developed then. Actually, the contract was signed after the conflict was over, the first war was over. Um, so. And in hindsight, it's, it's now clear that Azerbaijan has been accumulating this wealth and building this uh, military uh, arsenal uh, yeah, to revenge for the first war and eventually it succeeded. Uh, but when the, when the first contracts were signed, uh, I, I will be main, mainly talking about Azerbaijan because it's the only one that has uh, rich, is the rich in the region compared to Georgia and, and, and Armenia. Um, the, when the first contract signed, there was an opportunity to um, to build pipeline uh, through from Azerbaijan through Armenia to to Turkey, but um, it was. Uh, refuted from the from the beginning for the obvious reasons because Azerbaijan set as a precondition for to um, to, re to return its territories. Um, now in uh, in the new reality, it's uh, it's also possible uh, that uh, the new pipelines could be built or new infrastructure projects could be built, as I mentioned before, and um, that's the only way to. As, as they're usually dubbed in, in the Western media, these pipelines are usually called peace pipelines because it creates an interdependence in the region. And then um, the, the countries are deterred to attack each other if there is interdependence and economic gain. Uh, so it, on paper, 
it seems like uh, the best uh, solution to it. But as for the for the reasons that mentioned by uh, Professor Tanayan and Professor Asturian, for, for all the uh, other challenges that we have, and mainly, uh, I believe, and I will I will actually comment uh, on on uh, our Tom's points about that um, about the attitude uh, in Azerbaijan. I think the, the the major problem, major obstacle, and I, I think that links to our first question as well. The major problem in in both countries is the is the insecurity, is the psychological insecurity among the people. There is a there is a mistrust and. As long as uh, that mistrust, distrust remains, and as long as the people like us who are open for conversation and open for the dialogue are only marginal groups, uh, the there will be no future uh, for the region in terms of the peace, and and there will be no um, uh, interdependence. I don't. I seriously doubt that if there is any regime change in Azerbaijan, it will it. If, if it happens, of course, uh, it, it very soon, uh, it will have any impact on the thinking of Azerbaijanis. And we have seen the same thing in more democratic Armenia at the moment. As, as Professor Asturia mentioned, there is, there, is, there is more hatred right now. And I, I don't think that will change. And that's, that's very unfortunate, actually. That shows that uh, how people are so traumatized in, on, 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 uh, on both aisles of, uh, of the conflict, that uh, they are uh, they are choosing, they're preferring war. They are ready to uh, choose war over the peace and over the the communication. I think that is the is the major challenge, a major obstacle that we have to overcome. Any other comments? No. Stephen, you're muted. Stephen, Stefan, you're muted. One of the issues of Cox is that uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, imperial borderlands. And uh, uh, you have uh, powers, uh, in particular Russia, for understandable reason, uh, reasons uh, that still want to keep that area under their full control. Uh, you can see uh, what's going on with Georgia. There might be something bad coming up in uh, uh, the Ukraine. Uh, there are things uh, in uh, Moldova. So you notice the uh, a kind of belt of uh, instability. And uh, Russia, I, it will be, again, difficult to convince me that it is in favor of uh, uh, finding a definitive settlement to this issue. Hmm? Uh, finding a definitive settlement means losing total leverage on Armenia, uh, some leverage on Azerbaijan. Uh, so that complicates uh, uh, the whole thing. Uh, in addition, coming to resources, of course, I am not a specialist like uh, of that, like Rauf. Uh, but uh, uh, one aspect to keep in mind is the uh, asymmetry of resources, of course, that Rauf mentioned. The oil, and uh, very soon uh, the oil won't be that important, it will be gas, so far as I understand, based on reading uh, things right and left. Um, and in that type of state, as we know, most of the states like that, uh, uh, authoritarianism uh, seems to thrive in those places. Uh, President Aliyev uh, is actually now uh, based on what I hear and what I can read. I mean, he has become the sole hero of this war in Azerbaijan. He has no, uh, no competitors. I, it has become a moment of glorification for the president, you know, Aliyev, okay? Uh, I haven't seen, re I read some Azerbaijani, you know? I don't see other heroes emerging, you know, General Such and Such, Colonel uh, uh, Mamedov or something. No. Um, so there is a monopolization of that heroism uh, combined with the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the existing armenophobic policies that he has systematically de developed and uh, strengthened. And uh, I am not that uh, positive or optimistic about the near future. Actually, 
uh, one of the concerns I have, and I have trouble understanding it, uh, is that on the one hand, uh, President Aliyev is talking about a new future for the region, integration, communications, and so on. On the other uh, hand, he's taking steps that go uh, towards uh, uh, inflaming uh, Armenians, you know, not returning prisoners of war, creating that uh, pretty idiotic museum, uh, uh, useless monument destructions. Uh, um, I see a contradiction here. You know, if you want slow integration, communication, and so on, uh, uh, the less you uh, display your uh, grandiosity, the better it is. Hmm? Uh, I see in a, a mirror image of uh, something that happened in Armenia, that is the conviction that we have won forever. Uh, you know, Azeris can't do anything. You know, we, we crush them, we move. Uh, I read dozens of articles like that. Uh, the result was what we got in this war, that is, uh, the, uh, you know, a total disaster. Uh, uh, so I am looking for the moment when that rhetoric on the part of the president is, uh, uh, will change, and that might be the beginning of some improvement. But right now I am pretty, uh, very much pessimistic about, uh, about what will come next, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think another line of questions actually is along the lines of how do you think the role of the international community is situated within this conflict? From the Western perspective, as one um, individual asks, but also through the lens of regional authoritarian structures. I can chime in. I think, um, as, as I think was mentioned here before, you know, the, the international community really uh, disappeared, the international community disappeared during this conflict uh, because of the, the various reasons. I think Ralph uh, outlined them all, why everyone was distracted by other things. Um, I feel like I should put in a good word for Russia here. Um, it's not, uh, I feel like in the US, uh, there's a kind of, uh, uh, a reflex to say that, well, Russia clearly has its nefarious intent. Um, it's important to remember that nobody else was involved in this uh, and that Russia, there's a lot of kind of conspiratorial thinking that Russia somehow is maneuvering everything and created this whole situation so that it could, you know, bring in its peacekeepers and then exert control where it didn't have control before. I think the, the picture is more complicated and that Russia was taken a Russia did not expect this to happen. Uh, Russia didn't necessarily want this to happen. Um, its steps in the early stages of the fighting were very passive, very distant, uh, really conspicuously absent. Um, they eventually seemed to kind of figure out what was going on. And, and frankly, the, the way the war was going, had Russia not stepped in and uh, offered these peacekeepers, you would have seen probably a total ethnic cleansing within a few days uh, of the whole rest of Karabakh. Uh, and so, and nobody else was willing to do that. So I feel like that's a little bit of a, a, a step back that we should take in terms of Russia's role in this region. Um, another interesting thing to point out uh, is that this peacekeeping mission that they have, um, this is again, this is the kind of thing in Abkhazia and Moldova and, and so on that is, the thing that leads to an eternal Russian presence. Uh, this is the first time, as I understand, that Russia is uh, limited to a five-year term uh, in, and that at the end of the five years, either party can veto it. Uh, this is really gonna be a crucial thing because I don't particularly understand why Azerbaijan wouldn't veto it and that will effectively, maybe, maybe this Russian presence is just delaying the inevitable. Um, Azerbaijani retaking control over, over all of Karabakh. Um, but anyway, Russia did this fairly, you know, unprecedented thing, which is to put a time limit on their own uh, presence. Uh, and so that's, um, you know, another factor to consider. It's going to be whatever happens in four and a half years is going to be quite, um, quite important uh, to that respect. 
Does anyone else want to pick up on just the to, larger just to add on, community before I have a question as well? Yes. I just want to add a minor comment when Joshua said that you no know, other peacekeepers were interested. I mean, Scandinavians were interested, although they were not aware of it, that they were interested, as <laughs> according to the Trump administration. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a running joke. I think it was me who uh, said IKEA is about to dispatch its force, peacekeeping force to the region. So there, there are also several questions. I mean, in some ways, this is following up um, still on the thread that Carol has brought in from some of the questions. There are, are um, also several questions that specifically ask more about the role of Turkey and um, the role of Turkey and its relationship with both um, past relationship and current relationship with both of the primary parties. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Uh, I think all of only, us have an opinion on that. Yeah, the only Turkic here. I will, <laughs> I will, I will start. Uh, Turkey, uh, you, you know the relations between Turkey and Azerbaijan. They call it uh, fraternal nations, uh, two nations, one state, two states, one nation. Um, so they, um, there was, there is this attachment. There is this uh, alliance, and um, Turkey has been. Uh, uh, openly supporting Azerbaijan, uh, closed the borders with Armenia because of, of the territories, as it lost Azerbaijani lost territories in 1994, uh, particularly uh, because of Kelbajar. Um, so the Turkey's position was uh, was clear. The involvement of Turkey, uh, I think it was um, uh, should be noted, uh, besides the political support, although uh, people usually uh, confuse the um, the, uh, the amount of the weapon that were used. They the observers usually think that it's the Turkish uh, uh, war warfare, the new warfare, the UAVs that uh, contributed to the um, to the victory. But uh, actually, it was more Israeli uh, uh, UAVs that uh, Azerbaijanis has used. But uh, what Turkey provided as a uh, uh, as a support was the uh, the tactics that were deployed uh, uh, previously in in Libya and Syria especially in in the civil war uh, that start uh, with Turkish involvement from 2019 April 2019 the older tactics that were deployed there were uh, uh, used in in Armenia so there was in, in the war so there was this military support um, in terms of the uh, advising or uh, doing the joint drills. I think they had um, exercises, military exercises just before the conflict started. So it was, it was open. And there was, there was, um, there was an attempt again to, to be more active, actively involved in the, in, the, in the peace process and to be on the same table as a co-chairman as Russia, but that eventually failed. But Turkey still, um, uh, gain the foothold in, in in the in the South Caucasus. I think that's a major achievement for Georgia and for Turkey. And I'll leave it to other colleagues to. I think they have more. To say. Mm -hmm. I'll just chime in quickly, and I think that you know, with the this uh, two states, one nation kind of rhetoric that we always heard uh, between Turkey and Azerbaijan was always a bit superficial to me. Uh, that, that there was this was very much on a kind of cultural. Uh, emotional level and the actual um, uh, kind of support that Turkey gave Azerbaijan was very thin until last year. Uh, and you saw this really change very dramatically last year. And I think that that, um, I think that needs to be seen in the context of Turkey's overall kind of growing foreign policy ambitions in its region uh, with the Eastern Mediterranean, with Libya, with, with Syria. Um, and it's kind of using these, I think, in a way to, in, in a way that is reminiscent of Russia, sort of throwing its weight around regionally in a, in a bid to make itself look like a regional power, uh, partially for domestic uh, purposes to get uh, people excited about their country being a, a big player. Uh, I think, and, and, and that was really the, the story of this war last year uh, was Turkey's involvement. That was the critical 
um, ingredient that we never saw before. What I think is very uncertain now is what Turkey is going to do with this um, influence that it has in Azerbaijan. Um, Russia, you know, it's still, I think, a little bit precarious, Turkey's hold, and, and Russia still holds many more levers in the region uh, than Turkey does. And it's not clear what Turkey wants to do with this um, influence. And so I think that there's a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, as a journalist, I mean, this is what I'm trying to follow as much as possible, but there's very little information. There's very little, uh, there's, again, there's a lot of rhetoric and there's a lot of um, celebratory uh, discourse, but there's not a lot of uh, real understanding of what this is going to mean for, for Turkey and the region. Stefan, you go and yeah. then I'll go. Uh, you know, regarding Turkey, of course, it, it won't be a major uh, discovery if I tell you that uh, the relations of Armenia with Turkey are complicated by the issue of the Armenian genocide and its denial and its recognition and so on. Uh, uh, so that is a major hindrance, more, may, maybe not the uh, absolutely main one. Uh, remember that, uh, when was it? Around, uh, I have forgotten the exact date, 2008-2009, there was that period known as football diplomacy, where uh, Abdullah Gul came to Armenia and so on, and uh, uh, Armeno-Turkish protocols were signed in uh, Zurich. Uh, and suddenly, uh, President Aliyev, you know, didn't like it at all. Uh, the, took some steps with Russia to show his discontent. Uh, uh, and the Turkey put as a condition the settlement of the Karabakh conflict, plus a few other things. Uh, on the Armenian side, there were other complications. Bottom line, those protocols uh, uh, failed. I think the main interest of Turkey, even towards Azerbaijan, I mean, leaving aside these uh, nice words, you know, fraternal and so on, even though I believe those feelings exist, the two languages are very close uh, to one another. Uh, but remember also that the Kemalist Turks, uh, you know, collaborated with the Bolsheviks and uh, got rid of Azerbaijan enthusiastically in April 1920. Hmm? Uh, uh, and Azerbaijan was the first uh, so, so, uh, Soviet, uh, Republic of the Caucasus to be Sovietized. Uh, so things may be more complicated. I think the, the main interest of Turkey for Azerbaijan is that thanks to Azerbaijan, it has become the central uh, hydrocarbon uh, hub, you know, uh, in the Middle East. I mean, everything goes through Turkey uh, uh, abroad. And uh, that's a major asset that Azerbaijan has in its relationships with uh, Turkey, I believe. Maybe Rauf, uh, uh, I don't know, he knows more in that field than I do. But that's how I see it from, uh, again, afar, you know? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running the risk of... Uh... Uh, being labeled a complete heretic. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, that without Turkey's support, uh, this war may have not happened to the extent that it happened, or Azerbaijani gains would be much, much more limited than it was, because uh, not only Turkey provided intelligence gathering prior to the war, uh, during the war, I mean, there, are, there is evidence that Turkey was actively um, uh, involved in the war planning on the operational uh, level. Uh, there were uh, publications in the Russian press uh, from credible reporters and analysts that uh, Turkey was involved on a battalion level in, in the combat. They actually commanded uh, uh, certain units. And of course, the Bayraktars, the Turkish drones that uh, mildly contradicting to Raouf's statement that uh, the game changes were the uh, Israeli drones. I think that worked in unison, but I think uh, uh, it was the Turkish drones that effectively uh, destroyed the Armenian armor. 
And let's not forget the shock troops that Turkey uh, imported into the war theater uh, from Syria and Libya, uh, uh, mercenaries that it recruited actively through the MIT, the Turkish intelligence services, uh, who whether uh, by, by deceit or uh, through force of uh, earnest belief, they, they, they were willing to come and lay down their lives uh, in the region, it happened. And I think it is also something that was extremely important in, in the early days of the uh, conflict when uh, Azerbaijan was trying to keep uh, the deaths relatively low of its own troops uh, in order not to cause probably social consternations back in Baku or elsewhere. So these troops were used as sort of cannon fodder, really. Uh, they were foreign to the region. They didn't know the terrain. In many cases, all they had was a Kalashnikov and a promise of uh, $2,000 uh, to, to go on uh, to attack Armenian position. Uh, whether it fully worked or not in, in a tactical sense, it remains to be seen, but that Turkey uh, was able to utilize uh, whatever resources it was willing to put into action effectively. Uh, it, it did a, a mess. It did a masterful job. Uh, so. Ralph, um, you... can I comment on yeah I, um, on the on Turkey Turkish uh, relationship with Azerbaijan and the role of the energy, um, especially oil and gas? Yes, uh, all the uh, Azerbaijani pipelines that go to Europe or uh, transport commodities to Europe, they go through first Georgia and Turkey. And that has contributed to Turkish role as a, not as a hub from technical standpoint, but as a transit country. But I don't, I don't think that was the primary reason uh, or is the primary reason. Um, it, it did create some interdependence, but um, most of the, for instance, most of the uh, Turkey's gas come from Russia. Uh, and Russia has contributed more for Turkey becoming an uh, uh, energy transit country than, than Azerbaijan. But it did play an important role. It did create um, that uh, economic uh, interdependence or economic connection um, that was initially built on that fraternality or, or, uh, or other um, more uh, abstract uh, ideas. And if, I'm, if I may add something very small, uh, I think another uh, thing that drove uh, Turkish involvement, I think, had to do with uh, uh, the internal Turkish political dynamics. Uh, the wars in Syria and Libya were not exactly cause celebre in, tur in the Turkish society. There is not a whole lot of support inside Turkey uh, in terms of these wars that Turkey is engaged, its uh, economy is not uh, something that is uh, salutary in a, in, a, in a healthy shape. Uh, uh, and, and the war effort in these different regions, the, 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 the confrontations on and off, the love-hate relationship uh, with Russia in Syria and, and in Libya. And I think uh, this was sort of an easy victory for Erdogan to chalk up and present to, uh, to the Turkish public that we can solve problems and we can help uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Azerbaijan and so on and so forth. So I think that's also another aspect that needs to be considered when we talk about the Turkish involvement in the region. It was a, 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 a domestically also, among other things, domestically driven, uh, politically expedient move. Do we have time for one more question or no? It depends on who answers the question. I know that is true, but I, I think um, I, I wonder if um, you could speak to the human, the toll on individuals in the region, thinking through the lens of trauma and historical trauma there was a mention in terms of concern around cultural heritage. 
There is a mention in terms of the role that textbooks play. I mean, there are so many different kinds of tools that are used in different kinds of institutional framings that complicate and sort of impact people's lives in the region. And perhaps provide opportunities. I'll just say that yes. as a closing trajectory. So maybe brief comments. You know, there, were, there was a, a massive uh, refugee problem uh, during and after the first war. Uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, close to more than 350,000 Armenians from Azerbaijan, about 180,000 Azeris from Armenia, uh, about 600,000 or more. Uh, as a repopulation, you know, uh, driven out of those seven territories. So it's a massive misery. Uh, now uh, you have a similar thing on a smaller scale with the Harappa Armenians, you know, tens of thousands still in Armenia. Uh, the destructions there. Uh, when we talk about refugees, there is also the question. Uh, uh, Will President Ilham Aliyev uh, really be, uh, is going, is he going to be really successful in bringing back uh, those refugees uh, to those uh, regions? Uh, you know, when you have lived somewhere in Baku or wherever they are uh, for uh, what is now, now it's what, uh, let's say 27 years. Hmm? Uh, do you really want to return to uh, Adam? You know, uh, the kid who grew up in Baku has no clue about uh, Adam. Uh, you know, if his parents or grandparents were from Adam. Uh, that is also a question uh, to, to which I have no answer at this point. Maybe Rauf might have a better uh, assessment of that. But I am highly skeptical. Uh, uh, that uh, all those hundreds of thousands are enthusiastic about returning to uh, the place where their parents or grandparents lived. Uh, uh, even though I know that kind of myth remains among population, because I know the history of the Armenian genocide survivors, even 30 years later, up to the Second World War, some dreamed of returning, you know, to their native village, you know, in what was then uh, the Republic of Turkey, you know. Uh, so I know that those dreams remain, but that issue is unclear uh, to me. Uh, and uh, overall, uh, the, the cultural destruction, the reconstruction in those regions is a massive uh, project. Uh, and I think, as Joshua mentioned, the next three, four years will be crucial, not just for the Russian peacekeepers, but uh, to see what direction the region is taking. I think within a year or a year and a half, we'll be able to say whether all those beautiful words about uh, future uh, coexistence and opening of all communications and so on, we'll see whether uh, they are going to make some real progress, you know? So I would wait and see personally. Well, um, uh, from my personal experience, from the people that I, I'm not from Karabakh. I've never been to Karabakh. Um, I was grown, I grow, I, I was born and raised in Sumgait, and uh, I, for me, Karabakh, and for most of the people in in Azerbaijan of my age, was something unattainable, uh, something that you can only dream about, and that's. I think one of was one of the motivations uh, that drove actually this war and why these young men were so eager to die for their land because of to to achieve that uh, uh, goal. Uh, whether in practice they will be able, they will return or not, because they're first of all there is in most of the places there is nowhere to return. Uh, in other places, it's all mines. Uh, it needs to be cleared, and then infrastructure to be built. Um, there, there have been made some grandiose plans about building smart cities in in the region, and uh, you know having Iran, Russia, and Turkish companies uh, contribute 
to rebuilding. Some Turkic states like Uzbekistan have volunteered to build a school. Uh, so the, there, there are some ideas. And yesterday, President Aliyev uh, uh, actually said that uh, the the relocation, or return of of the displaced, will start from next year, but in in phase in phases, of course. Um, I you you mentioned the human fact, factor. Um, I have a friend who, who lost his father during the first war uh, in Jabrail. And um, so I, I asked him after the war whether he would return or not. Uh, he said, yes, he would return, but uh, you know, it's, it, it, it will, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger decision to, you know, to relocate and to live there, but you know, he, he has that intention to go there. So I think it will depend on the, on the economic status, on social status, on, on many other aspects of the issue. But um, I've seen that desire to go back uh, in, you know, to that obscure land, to, the, to where they have lost. I think that mainly comes from the trauma that have been mentioned here for many times. Um, and, you know, it will be all clear when the jubilation is over, when this triumph uh, that is going on uh, is over and when people come uh, to the reality down to earth, they will make, I think, more rational decision. Thank you. Tamra? So I just want to, sorry, I, so I just want to thank our panelists for a very, very rich and multi-layered analysis. Um, we are probably now left with more questions than we came in with, but in a good way that hopefully will motivate us to, to search even more and, and um, to encourage this broader kind of conversation and broader uh, media coverage and, um, and engagement across these communities as I think uh, several of you have have implied would also be a step that's needed here. So again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions. And um, we'll sign off for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Carol. And bye. Nice.